Thanks so much for coming out. Thanks so much for inviting me to London. Is this working? And thanks to uh, Elaine and Sean and Ashley and everyone uh, for putting it together. So my name's Dave, traveled here down the road from Toronto. And this is an exhibit that was up in Toronto for about three months, uh, November, December, and January. And it's traveling within Toronto. It's actually going to Toronto City Hall uh, in July. And it's been to uh, Havergal College. And um, it's also been, um, it's going to Burlington and it might be going to Calgary and some folks in Hamilton want to see it. So it's great that it's getting uh, exposure after it came down the walls from our first installation. I've been doing grassroots community organizing or activism for about 15 years, focused on, um, as I was introduced, specific issues like bike lanes, voting reform, etc. Over the last five years, though, I've really shifted my focus away from those specific campaigns and try to step, take a step backwards and look at the whole democratic system. Um, in terms of how to make it work better, how to make it more fair, how to make it more inviting, more engaging, more participatory, etc. And the goal is really to get beyond the usual suspects. I'm a geek. I'm a total political geek. I go to City Hall. I look at agendas. I read the minutes. I know who all the councillors are. We have 45 of them. I know each ward, each councillor. That's ridiculous. That's almost obsessive. We don't want people, we're, we, we're not encouraging people to be like me. What we want to do is create a society where everyone feels that they can engage in the democratic decision-making process in a very small way and fit it into their normal lives. I don't have a normal life, and I wouldn't suggest that people should have a life like mine. Um, we don't need more full-time activists. We need to create a culture of political engagement where it's normal for, a norm for my mom, my sister, to go to City Hall to make a, a short deputation about an issue that affects them in their neighborhood. We have to normalize engagement without calling it activism. Anyways, that was all a tangent. What was I supposed to say? OK. Um, so let me first talk about the metaphor. So the exhibit's called the fourth wall. The fourth wall is a theater term. Uh, some of you might know it. It's used in both film and in stage theater. And the idea is that when you're on a stage, there's a wall on your right, a wall on your left, a wall behind you, and there's a wall right here. This is the fourth wall. It's an invisible wall that doesn't exist unless you're Pink Floyd. They actually build it up during the wall, but that's an unusual circumstance. The fourth wall is usually a virtual space that uh, separates the audience from the actors. And you want to have that in theater because you want to have two different realities. The audience is in their reality watching the show, and the show is existing in a different reality. And if I'm an actor, in a play, I wouldn't be looking at you as I am now. I'd be looking at the other actors. We'd be talking to each other and never making eye contact with you because you don't exist. You're not in our world. And likewise, you as the audience play your own role. You consume the, the show passively. You don't walk on the stage. You don't talk to the actors. That's considered rude. It's called heckling. You can get kicked out for doing that. And that's appropriate in theater. That's, how, that's what makes theater work the idea that there's a suspended reality on the stage. We don't want to have that in politics, and I think it's a perfect metaphor to describe where politics is right now. Uh, we have actors on the stage who are decision makers, city staff, city councillors perhaps, and a lot of people perceive the process as happening on a stage, separate from them. So they're talking to each other once they're elected. Okay, thank you, you voted, thank you very much. We're gonna to talk to each other for four years and do whatever we think is best and not invite you to speak with us. We're not even going to look at you. But likewise, I think we also have to take some of the blame as audience members. As citizens, we don't have the confidence, the guts, whatever, to get up on that stage, to heckle, to talk. You're not supposed to consume politics in a passive way. It's not a spectator sport. You have to be engaging it all the way. It's not theater. So how do we, how do we get rid of the theater metaphor? In, in the, the theater metaphor, it's usually used in the context of breaking the fourth wall. So when an actor actually looks at the audience, either in a play or in a movie, uh, um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Matthew Broderick looks at the film and you know, looks in the camera, and he's, he, you know, he'll put these words up on the camera and he'll be talking. And the movie ends after the credits. He looks out of the theater and he says, "Go home, go home. It's over," which is hilarious. He, he's acknowledging that that he's being watched. And you can do that in theater, too. You can break the fourth wall in theater by an actor looking at the audience or an audience member either heckling or throwing a tomato or walking up on stage. 
and you're either way, you're saying the same thing. We're all in the same room. It's not two realities, it's one reality. How do we get to a stage politically where we all see ourselves as part of the same reality, the same dialogue, the same discussion? I've got a great example of how the fourth wall manifests itself in our political culture. This is a list of referendums that were held in Toronto uh, in our history. We don't hold too many anymore. Um, and when we do, they're often ignored. We had a referendum, for example, not to amalgamate. Ha! All six cities said we don't want to amalgamate. That's funny. Um, anyways, so we've had all these referendums, and there was an interesting referendum 100 years ago, 1912. There was a referendum to expand the term of city councillors and the mayor to two years, because they had single year terms. Most people don't know this. For most of Toronto's history, and, and London as well, I would assume, we had elections every year. We used to hold them on, election, on, on uh, New Year's Day. So you'd go out and get drunk, New, on New Year's Eve, and you'd wake up and you'd vote. And it was a holiday, which is kind of silly, but it, the important part is that, is that it was on a holiday. And uh, both BC and Quebec actually hold their elections on weekends, which I think is a great idea, but that's, that's, an, that's a, a tangent. So they had this uh, referendum in 1912, and they asked the citizens, can we expand our term? Now, why would they ask the citizens? because the citizens are in charge, right? Politicians work for the citizens. So they said, we have a one-year term, we wanna have a two-year term, it'll save money, it'll be more efficient, you won't have to vote, who wants to vote every year? The citizens said, no way. We wanna keep you on your toes. We want elections every single year. 6,700 6, said yes, 23,800 said no. They were prepared to vote every year, to spend the money, they didn't wanna have less accountability. And that vote was respected. They kept the term at one year. Politicians really wanted a two-year term, so they had another referendum, and another one, and another one, and another, and another, and another, and another. Eight referenda over a 40-year period, until in the 1950s, the citizens said, fine, you can have a two-year term. We're sick of you asking us for it. Take it, you can have two years. Fast forward to 2006, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and the mayor of Toronto, David Miller at the time, went to Dalton McGuinty and said, hey, listen, we wanna have a longer term. We wanna have a four-year term. And Dalton McGuinty said, yeah, okay, sure. And that was it. It wasn't even put into a bill about municipal governance. It was one line buried in a, in a provincial budget bill. Terms will now be four years. Imagine the difference. What a huge cultural shift that from 1912 to the 1950s, everyone understood, the politicians, the media, the public, everyone understood that you couldn't possibly change the term of a municipal politician without having the consent of the voter because the voters are supreme. The voters are in charge. How, how many of you could go to your boss tomorrow and say, oh, by the way, I extended my contract? It would be insane, right? And they knew that back then. You couldn't do it. But somehow, in 2006, it didn't even occur to them. It's the fourth wall. They're looking at each other. I'm David Miller. I'm Dalton McGinty. Can I have a four-year term? Sure, okay. I'm not even looking at you. I don't even know you're there. You don't exist. There's a wall. But citizens also knew, I mean, it wasn't completely hidden. It was on an agenda. There was an article or two in the, in the newspaper. People didn't rise up and express their views. A few of us did. And anyways, now we have four-year terms. So I think there's been a cultural shift. I think there's been a a lost sense of what role citizens play in the political system other than voting. Voting is such a tiny thing. And with these terms growing longer and longer, there's less of a chance to even do that. Um, so one of the examples I use in the exhibit, or let me just say briefly, the exhibit consists of about 12 panels, as you can see. Each one looks at a different theme or topic related to municipal governance. And out of that comes 36 concrete, achievable, small recommendations that I think are all something that could be implemented. Most of them would apply to London, I believe. We'll have to go through them one by one to check later, but I think almost every single one of them would, would relate to your situation here. One of the things I look at, which is this panel here, and it's highlighted in my TED talk, is the public notices. And I don't know what yours are like here in London, but I assume they're probably similar, because it's kind of a standard format. Um, 
these, this is a notice of application, right, for a zoning change, for a new building, et cetera. The idea behind these is supposed to be that citizens should know if something major is going to happen in their neighborhood, and maybe they even have an opinion on it, and maybe there should be a mechanism for them to express that opinion. This is the first step, alerting the citizens that something is happening. It's a notice. What you'll notice about it, though, is that it's designed very poorly. In fact, it's not designed at all. It's probably designed in Word. And Word isn't a design program. It's probably designed by a lawyer. And lawyers shouldn't design things. Um, the most important piece of information to have in this is the address. I mean, there's tons of these in the newspaper all the time. No one's going to read them all. The one that you want to know about is the one that's in your neighborhood. How would you know that if the address wasn't somehow bright and, and you know, big and bold and at the top? But they don't even use bold. Bold is a modern technology that we've had for at least <laughs> 10, 15 years? Have we, we've had bold, I think, maybe even 20 years. I think we've had bold for 20 years. WordPerfect had bold. And they're not using it in this document. So what we did is um, we asked people, designers in Toronto. This was done through my blog. I don't even know who these people are. And I said, sorry, I'm moving out of, is that okay if I move out of your frame? Can you, I'll just. Um, we asked people, uh, it was an open call for submissions. Designers of Toronto, how would you design a public notice if your goal was to go beyond the minimum requirements of the Ontario Planning Act and actually try and achieve three or four goals? Number one, catch people's attention. Find me a billboard anywhere in the world that just uses black and white text with no color and no images. There's a reason why graphic artists use those technologies like bold and color and images, because they work. So catch people's attention. Give them the basic information they need to know what's happening in their neighborhood. Proactively encourage them to submit their opinion and clearly state what the mechanisms are to express your opinion. How would you design it? And we got all these amazing submissions from complete strangers. You'll see they all have color, they all have images, they all have the address very bold, and they all have proactive statements like, have your say, we want to hear from you, we're listening to Toronto, your voice matters, speak up Toronto, etc. Why shouldn't cities be proactive and seek input rather than just you know, do the bare minimum to meet the requirements of the Planning Act? Um, companies, I think, are starting to learn that good ideas come from the bottom. It's called crowdsourcing. It's called being in touch with your staff, being in touch with your, your customers. That creative innovation won't come from the boardroom necessarily. It might come from the bottom up. And likewise, we want to have a leadership style at our city councils that acknowledges that all the good ideas won't come from council. Council's job is to, in the end, is to make the decisions, not to come up with all the ideas. And citizens know best about how to run their neighborhoods and what they want to see on their streets and in their parks and in their alleyways and sidewalks, et cetera. So the question really boils down to, do cities want op opinions or not? Are they almost going out of their way to discourage uh, uh, opinions? I would say that this is evidence right here that cities are making zero effort to actually encourage citizens' uh, input. And here's another, I love this example. This is a parking ticket. I don't know if they look the same in London. It's a Toronto parking ticket. Um, I get them sometimes, you know, you're in a rush or something. But the funny thing about the parking ticket is, if you want to pay the ticket on the back, they make it very easy. If you want to pay it, you can pay it um, by phone, you can pay it online, you can do it uh, with a credit card, you can do it, um, you can mail it in. But if you want to fight the ticket, can't, you can't do that by phone, can't do that online. You have to go in with the ticket, wait in line. It's very intentional, it's very smart. So they're, they're making the easiest path for you to pay the ticket and very difficult to fight the ticket. And I think we do the same thing when it comes to urban planning. We make it very, very difficult for people to attend meetings, to speak at meetings, to even know the meeting is happening. To, uh, we use um, language, kind of like insider jargon, that makes it, what's a deputation? Like, most people don't even know, what, is that the word you use in London? Delegate. Dele like when you speak at a meeting? So ours is called deputation. Most people wouldn't even know what that is. A lot of the, uh, the language we use uh, in our agendas and our staff reports, even though we, there's been a movement towards plain language, it's still very um, alienating. Most people still don't even know the difference between the jurisdictions of municipal, provincial, and federal. 
right? So how can we expect them to make that leap to actually make a deputation at City Hall? Most people think that City Halls only deal with naming streets and putting in speed bumps. Because we have this idea that federal government is the highest. It deals with the important stuff. And then the province deals with some stuff too, and then city halls don't really do much. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our daily lives are much more impacted by city hall than by Queen's Park or Ottawa. Our, 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 our schools, our roads, our daycares, our, our libraries, our water, our transit systems, our bike lanes. I mean, you can go on and on and on. So, I mean, we have a lot of work to do because people don't know the important role the city hall plays. They don't feel that they have a voice there. And even if they feel that they want to have a voice, they don't know where they're supposed to express it. And I think that political culture of the fourth wall is so deep that they don't even feel that it's appropriate. You know, who am I? I'm just one person. Why, why does my voice matter? We have professionals on staff. We have these brilliant city councillors and our mayor. Who am I to speak out? Well, you're very important. No one is more important than you in your own reality. So we need to get people to have that confidence. Okay, two more quick things. Um, this is a guide to participation in your local government. Sounds like a great idea. It's a printed book, it's got color, it's got graphics. It tells you about how city council works. Um, it has a ward map, and they haven't printed any of these in eight years. <laughs> Mel Lastman had these in Toronto under his term, and David Miller had them in his first term, but not the second term, and we haven't seen them yet under Rob Ford. In fact, if you go into City Hall, and this is the last panel over here called Upgrading the Clamshell, there's um, 144 leaflets and flyers in the lobby of Toronto City Hall. And I have a funny online video about this where I did a kind of hidden camera interview with the, the receptionist asking for some information. Out of the 144 leaflets and flyers, guess how many of them are about municipal governance? Two, it's very pessimistic. It's 144. Any other guesses? Come on, engage. Your voice matters. Is the fourth wall here. You're all just passively. 25, let's hear some more. None. You're right, zero. There is nothing. You were close. You weren't pessimistic enough. There is no, no physical materials anywhere in the lobby of Toronto City Hall, a city of two and a half million people that has anything to do with City Hall as the home of our municipal government or how to engage in politics. And I, in this video, I go up to the receptionist and I say, hi, do you have a... Do you have a map of the wards? Do you have any information on how to start a residence group? Do you have any information on the council structure? Do you have any information on how to make a deputation? Um, do you have information about how to run for the next election? And she has nothing at her desk. And she points me over to these, this row of flyers that are all essentially, it, it's a tourist kiosk. It's flyers about uh, marine land and Niagara Falls and Canada's Wonderland, which are all important drivers of our economy and things that kids love, but this is City Hall. That's how bad things have gone. Now, um, partially, I'm going to say something that surprises you, perhaps. Part of the problem here is that I think we've embraced uh, web applications and, and, and online resources too much. We've gone so far to how do we get to Gov 2.0 and Gov 3.0 and 4.0 and whatever that we've forgotten about paper. And paper is really important, and pamphlets are important, and public notices in newspapers are important. Because more people still read newspapers and look at billboards than use their iPhone apps. Uh, and there's a reason why companies still spend billions of dollars on ads in newspapers and on billboards. I mean, they could spend all that money just on their own website. And that was the answer. When I went to City Hall and asked about this, they said, oh, we don't, we don't need flyers now in the lobby. It's all online. And I said, that's funny, because those 144 leaflets for tourist attractions, they probably have websites too. But they thought that it's in their interest to spend money to make very well-designed, glossy, colorful leaflets that, that promote Canada's wonderland. Well, where is our glossy leaflet, not just at City Hall, but in every community center, school, library, saying, this is how the city works. This is where you fit into the city. Another great metaphor is uh, IKEA. When you buy a piece of furniture at Ikea, and it comes in all these pieces, it comes with a booklet telling you how to put it together. Imagine trying to put together an Ikea desk without that booklet. It would be so frustrating. We don't produce booklets for City Hall and for government. And one of the things we talk about here, it's called the next generation, I think it's the third one, is the absolute lack of useful um, civics classes in elementary and, and, and high school. 
And the, um, on most of these panels, I try and not just complain, but also look at best practices in other cities. Calgary has a city hall school in the lobby of city hall where uh, students spend an entire week with their teachers and city councillors and city staff from 10 different departments and the mayor learning about how city hall works and how urban planning works at city hall, a classroom. It's obvious once you see it. Um, in Toronto, we, we don't have anything like that. In Ontario, we do a bit of civics in grade five and then a half credit in grade 10. That's it, a half credit that tries to cover municipal, provincial, and federal, and even some global, like Craig Kielberger stuff, all in a half credit. It's impossible. And which one's going to get overshadowed? Municipal, of course, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. So kids aren't learning what City Hall is, what role plays, and how they can be involved. Um, one more quick thing, and then I'll wrap it up. And then what we'll do is I'll be around. People can just ask me questions, and I'll float around the room. And I encourage you to go to the change camp thing on Saturday. Um, elections. Reforming our elections um, would, would drastically shift the political culture and get so many more people involved. There's lots of different ways to do it. I ran a project called Better Ballots in 2006. The website is betterballots.to. And we looked at 14 options for local voting reform, just at the municipal level. Looking at ideas, not hypothetical academic exercises, but looking specifically at municipal reforms that are already in use somewhere in North America whether it's term limits or runoff voting or municipal parties or weekend voting or online voting or whatever you want. Some of the ideas I love, some of them I hate. I hate the idea of parties at City Hall. But it's interesting to talk about it. Quebec uses parties, BC uses parties. It's worth having a debate. I think parties are evil myself, but that's just, that's just my opinion. Um, the one change that I think would really, really shift the political culture, and I'm gonna spend two minutes talking about this and then I'm gonna wrap it up, um, is runoff voting. So currently we use first past the post for all three levels of, of government and it fails us horribly at all three levels. Provincially and federally, there's options for proportional representation, which I won't get into now because it's complicated and we've had four referendums in Canada and lost them all. Um, so we're, we'll just have to, be, have to be patient with that. Municipally, it's hard to do proportionality because we don't have parties and mixed member proportional needs parties and STV works much better with parties, but let's not go there. What we can do at the municipal level, and I honestly think it would overnight change our political culture, it's just called runoff voting, which can be done in multiple rounds or instant runoff. And the reason it's important is this. If you have two people running for, for, um, for mayor, let's say, can we have a volunteer? Can you come up for a second? So Ellen's gonna run, for, me and Ellen are running for mayor. Is that okay? Okay, and the big issue of the day is glasses versus non-glasses, okay? It's a big, big fight. Big, big fight. Everyone's really upset about it. And 60% want glasses. 40% do not want glasses. 60% feel so strong that they, they can't stand me. They can't stand the idea of having a mayor without glasses. So if you and I run for mayor, who's going to win? Who's going to win? 60% want glasses. Ellen's going to win. That makes sense. That's an election. That's a democracy. Most people can't stand the idea of a non-glassed mayor. So you're going to win. Congratulations. That's an election. But hold on. It's not that simple. What if Sean wants to run too? Come up, Sean. I know you're tweeting, but come up anyways. We put this 140 character tweet on hold. So now we're going to have an election. What happens if that 60% splits? Half of them like Sean, half like Ellen. So now suddenly we have 30, 30, 40. I just won the election. Nothing changed on my part. 60% of the city still hate my guts. Can't stand the thought of me running the city, but they split the vote. So first of all, the majority went unheard. Um, they were ignored. Uh, it's called vote splitting. But the real problem here isn't just that the results are unfair. The real problem is that what actually happens is this. Can you back up, do a slow-mo walking backwards? Back to when I asked you to, so you got to, okay, backwards, 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 and stop. So what's actually going to happen here? Ellen's already in the race. It's a two-way race. Sean thinks about running. What's going to happen as he enters the race? What are the glass people going to say to him? What are you going to say to him? Don't do it. You're going to split the vote. This is the most toxic element of our political culture. It's usually a younger person 
It's actually usually the opposite gender. It's a female. It's often a person of color. It's someone who isn't as connected. It's someone whose father wasn't a politician before them. And they get the courage to run, and they say, I want to run for office. I'm going to do it. And their own allies say, no, no, no. You can't do this. You're making a big mistake. You're going to make a lot of people very angry at you. Imagine the negative long-term consequences of our most passionate, engaged young people wanting to run for office, being told not to run by their own political allies. With runoff voting, you lose that. You lose strategic voting. You lose vote splitting. Everyone's welcomed in because it actually helps you if he runs, as long as you stay a bit above him. Everyone knows how a runoff works, I assume, because we've seen it. All of, our, all of our parties use runoffs. Every party, liberal, conservative, NDP, to choose their leaders. It's good enough for them. It's just not good enough for us for some reason. The way it works is let's come back up. So we didn't actually get exactly 30-30. It's probably more likely something like 31, let's say 29-40, right? You won't have a perfect split. Oh, we got a little closer, so we're in the shot. You can edit that part out to make it smoother, as if it all just happened on its own. Um, in a runoff, if no one gets a majority on the first count, then no one won. And the person with the least is dropped out. So one of you would drop out, whoever got a little bit less. Let's say it's Sean. Thanks for running. <laughs> And then you tell everyone to vote again. And uh, for example, in, in, in France, they're doing this right now. They're in the middle of a two-round election for president. So no one got a majority in the first. Most American cities do this. If you run for mayor of an American city, you'll have a second election two weeks later if no one gets a majority. Um, because now when we vote, all of Sean's supporters will come back to you, and you're going to win. Congratulations. But two more quick things. You can go. Thank you. Hand for our volunteers. It does two more good things. First of all, you don't actually have to have a round two weeks later. You have a ranked ballot. And this is what all the parties are using now. The NDP used it a few weeks ago um, for Mulcair. Um, they used it for Horvath. The liberals will use it next year for whoever, whatever they're doing over there. Um, the way it works is that you rank your choices. You don't just pick who you want to win. You go one, two, three. And that way, when Sean dropped out, we don't have to ask everyone to come back to vote between me and Ellen. We already have his ballots. And we know who his supporters put second. Well, they put Ellen second. She has glasses, right? It's called an instant runoff. The computers, the computers can tabulate a runoff in, in instantly. With, and, and like I said, anyone can run. You can always vote with your heart. No str strategic voting. And also, it makes campaigning more positive. Under the current system, Ellen and Sean are going to throw insults and attacks at each other to try and push down the other glasses, right? You were, you were once caught smoking pot. You were drinking and driving. There's rumors that you abused your wife. You, uh, you, you know, there's a rumor that you stole some money from some nonprofit 20 years ago. Any rumor you can find, it's called dirt, and it drives our political culture. In a runoff, that's a really bad strategy. You win under our current system by throwing dirt under a runoff, you win by gaining the support of your opponent's supporters. You want them to like you. So if Ellen or Sean drops out, I want to make sure that some of them come to me so I can't spend the debates attacking them and criticizing them. Also, if I disagree with something, I won't say, well, that's stupid. You don't even know what you're talking about. I'll say, well, that's a very interesting perspective. I see where you're going, and I respect that, and I would do it a little bit differently. Everything suddenly becomes mutually respectful. And I think that'll attract more people into politics. Anyway, that's one example. There are so many concrete ways from educating the youth to creating signage that informs the citizens to having uh, our city halls with printed information that is, is attractive and engaging, electoral reform, making meetings meaningful, et cetera. Uh, so there's 36 ideas. I'm throwing them out to you. They'll be explored at the change camp. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I hope that some of it is useful to you, and I wish you luck on your journey. Thank you.